Hello and welcome. I am Scarperlock and this is City of Villains on the Rebirth server. We are with our mastermind, level 40, Nightmare Lass, who has 9.6 million XP earned. About a half a million to go to get to level 41 in our next superpower. 95 million infamy. And we are on a story arc for Ghost Widow. Before we get to that, I do want to show you one thing for those of you who are on Homecoming and don't use uh, Rebirth. Uh, Rebirth has the Paragon Rewards system. The idea in the old days was that you would subscribe instead of just playing for free. And every month, I guess, you got one of these medallions. Um, in Rebirth, they give you one a week. And they give you some extras for certain things like when they did holidays or rebooted the machine and it had downtime and stuff like that. So as you can see, I've got them all now. I have 54 tokens spent. And what happens is after you've unlocked all of them, you can, these ones that have green circles, you can just take over and over again. So for instance, what I've been doing is taking this one, the super pack with heroes and villains cards in the hopes of getting maybe a single origin ATO uh, origin um, enhancement that I could use or something like that. Um, so I just wanted to show you that we are basically done with our veteran rewards. And now we're working on our story arc with Ghost Widow, who says... We have the incantation. We have the components. The only thing we're missing for this ritual is Numina. But don't think you can just go bursting into Paragon City to find her. No, she's clever. And we'll have to be lured into our territory and then trapped long enough to hold her to the fight. And while I have an idea of how to trap her, I need to know more about how to lure her in. And that's where my spies come in handy. It turns out that the Cray Corporation recently did a study of Numina. I want you to get it for me. Their more scientific perspective may give me a clue on how to draw Numina into the trap. So now we are going to infiltrate the Cray Corporation and try to find out what they know about Numina. So this story arc will be the only one we do at level 40. I will bring you back for another one at level 41. I suspect there are a couple of more parts to this one. Um, and when it's done, I guess we will unlock the Ghost Widow Epic Pool abilities. However, I'm only going to choose that if I have no choice. I would actually prefer um, to see if one of the other Epic Pools is available. But we'll just have to see what they offer us when we get to level 41. So now I went invisible there because this zone is all above level 40. 40 is the minimum for the zone, and consequently, um, there are spots when you fly through here where you can get shot at by, like, purple conning guns and stuff like that, and you can really get your butt kicked. So, um, I just go invisible so they can't see me or bother me. All right, so our minions are awake. We buff them up. One, two, and three. This third one only works on Curly. If I feel the need to mez defense the rest of them, I'll do that in the mission. I'm not going to bother with everybody because it only lasts a minute or so, and then it'll go back down. And by the time I buff them all, the first one will need to be rebuffed, so it's just not worth it. It's not worth it for, like to do it as part of the uh, standard operating procedures or SOP of entering a mission. It is worth it when you know you're going to be facing an elite boss or something and I sometimes do often do forget to um, to apply it before we go into a fight or I remember to apply it to Curly but I don't always remember to apply it to Larian Mo. There's no point to applying it to the little guys most of the time. Now one thing I do sometimes do is if I see them being mezzed like a flash or something, I will um, lay it on them to remove that mez, and that often will work. And that to me is easier than trying to manage all six of them and keep the mez buff up on all of them. It's one thing to just keep it up on Curly because he's our linchpin, he's our most important guy. Um, I'm going to start getting rid of these heals and hope for some better inspirations. 
oranges or purples, break freeze, those are the ones we look for. So we need to find three pieces of information. They like to do things in threes. There were three ritual spell components as well. Oh no, two pieces of information. I misread that. So I'm wrong about that one. I was going to add to that ambushes often come in threes as well. Um, but nope, this is only two pieces of information. Now, you know, as a, you know, putting your DM's hat on under normal circumstances, I would say that um, given the structure of the space, there's an elevator here. There's an elevator here. There's an elevator here. Um, well, I was going to say, given the structure of this base, to me, logically, there should be two sets of elevators rather than three, and there should be a clue on each of the levels to which the elevators lead, but um, but who knows? Clearly, they have three different levels here, so one of the levels is going to be empty of clues. Oh, okay, so usually, often there's a boss in this room, but it's just yellow cons. If they're going to keep giving us two yellow cons, this mission is going to be stupidly easy. So hopefully they'll start giving us some oranges. Here we go. Still only two at a time is not very challenging. I mean, I don't even have to do any teleporting or anything if there's only, if there are only two of them. And you can see the oranges take a little longer to beat up, but they're not really of any major danger to us. Can't really even do much to the little guys, let alone the big ones. I've always wondered with these, where, where they have three elevators and I hear a glowy. I've always wondered if the map that each elevator leads to is fixed and static, or if Whichever one you go up first, say, would be this map. It doesn't matter which one you pick. And whichever one you goes up second is the second map, and third is the third map. Or if they actually... The east one always leads to this level, regardless. In the old days, when I was a uh, young DM, I would have made it the former way. I would have said, okay, there are three elevators. They have to find two things, right? So they're going to have to go up at least two elevators... But I used to want to make my players go through every bit of every map that I created. And so um, I would have said, okay, whichever map they go up first isn't going to have one of the glowies on it. It's going to have none of them. And then the map they go up second will have one of them and the third will have the other one. This way they have to go up all three maps. Nowadays I don't do that. I design the map objectively and I will often provide clues to the players up oh, and we're getting ambushed I will often provide clues to the players that potentially enable them to shortcut things if they're looking if they're careful if they're thoughtful if they're watching if they're patrolling if they're sneaking if they're spying if they're mapping it out carefully if they're if they're being smart about it I will provide clues so that they can shortcut it if they want now Sometimes the players don't want to shortcut it. I mean, one of my, my best friend who plays, I think he'd be perfectly happy to crawl. Even though he said he doesn't like dungeon crawls, I think he would be, he would, by his instinct, leave no stone unturned. That's, I've played, you know, co-op computer games with him. That's the way he, 
plays co-op computer games when we play Divinity Original Sin or something. Every every nook and cranny gets to be explored because there might be a quest, there might be something cool here, there might be magic items, there might be treasure. You don't leave any stone unturned, and that's just sort of the old school way to play. So even though he complains, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> even though he complains about the old school way to play, he actually plays it that way. And I think if he had control of our D&D games, he would go through every little nook and cranny. And so, for example, let's say we find another glowy on this level. That means we don't, and the mission is complete. We didn't go to the third level. Um, if he and I were playing together, he and this were a not, if not City of Heroes, but just sort of a normal D&D game, he'd say, let's go to the third level and see what's there. Right, and if you said, well, we don't need to, so yeah, but there might be treasure there. Now, in City of Heroes, there isn't any treasure, right? Treasure comes from random drops, from defeating mobs, so there isn't any treasure. There isn't anything to be gained. If the glowy is on this level, there is, and and we get a mission complete, there isn't really any reason to go onto the other levels. Um, even in terms of like you get experience from defeating mobs, well, you can do that in the next mission, right? So, unless there's some reason, right? Like back in the old days, <clears throat> you didn't want to skip parts of the mission because there weren't enough story arcs to get you to max level, to, like to your next level anyway. And so you didn't want to skip the experience you gained from the mission because then you're going to street hunt, right? But nowadays, there's enough content in City of Heroes that generally you shouldn't have to street hunt to gain levels. Of course, they do make you do newspaper or radio missions to get to contacts, and but there's sort of no avoiding that. And... um and there isn't any reason to milk those for experience, right? Which is kind of what you're doing. If if the glowy is, say, in this room, and we get mission complete, if I don't complete the mission, and I go through and defeat every other guy that's in here, even though we don't need to, <clears throat> that's milking the mission for experience. That's trying to max out the amount of experience, the total amount of experience you gain per mission. It's not necessarily increasing the XP gained per minute or per hour, but it's it's increasing the XP gained per mission. And you do that if you think that there aren't enough missions to gain you to the next level range, right? You, there aren't enough missions to get to level 45. Then you want to milk every mission for every ounce of experience it's got. But on, other than that, there really isn't any reason in City of Heroes to go into... Um, where are my minions? Let's go, guys to go into the areas after the mission is complete that you haven't been, right? But in a game like D&D, &D, there might be. So, for example, when my players at level 4 went through a necropolis and they were trying to rescue their friends and they left a bunch of tombs unexplored, well, there were some pretty cool magic items and treasure in those tombs that didn't pertain to the adventure. They weren't part of the plot, but might have been nice for them to have. In fact, the cleric made a comment. The players, the cleric's player, made a comment in the last session. They found some magic items. They found a magic. They found some magic armor, um, where they think might be magic armor. They found very nicely crafted leather armor, studded leather armor, studded leather armor plus one. And he wears studded leather armor because, although he's a cleric, he's near coker and he has to fly, so he can't wear heavy armor and fly. And so he has regular leather armor and a shield. Uh, regular studded leather armor and a shield, and so, whoop. So used to flying around the emptiness here. You guys are really slow, aren't you? Um, so used to flying around the emptiness here that I didn't realize there was somebody in, in place. Um, so yeah, he has, he want, he, he made the comment, you know, Mike, all my character has is like a ring of swimming. I think that's, I think that's what he has. So the only, other than potions, it's the only significant magic item he has. <clears throat> the ranger has a magical cloak that she earned by um, doing a quest with the Beastmasters. And she has a dagger plus one that I actually meant for the cleric. Because at one point he was using a dagger early on. He had a dagger in his inventory and he used it a couple times. And so the dagger plus one was for the cleric. <laughs> but when they found the dagger plus one, he was like, I use spells most of the time, I don't need it. And so he uh, he gave the dagger to the ranger. So she's got a magic dagger, and she has a magic cloak that 
the dagger's plus one, and the cloak gives her plus one armor class when she pulls the hood up, which there's no reason for her not to do, so she leaves it up most of the time, and it also gives her some extra bonuses to stealth. It's basically a souped-up cloak of elvenkind. Um, the sorcerer now has goggles of the night, which um, enable him to have dark vision. He's a human, so that helps him. Could work for the cleric, too, but the cleric said you can take it, right? He's been very... Um, He's been very generous, not not asking for the most most of the magic items. So when the leather armor showed up, well, many of the characters, the ranger, the rogue, and the cleric all used studded leather armor. And the cleric's player said, "Well, just just to keep in mind, all my guy has right now is a ring of swimming." Uh, many of the other magic items they he's given to the other uh, characters. A lot of the potions have gone to the dwarven fighter rogue because. Um, like giant strength, growth, things like that, increase his strength then, because he's a strength-based rogue, they figured, you know, it'd be good for him to have. Um, so anyway, we just went through that level, and there was nothing here. Uh, but yeah, in the Necropolis, um, there was some stuff there that the cleric might have found useful, but they didn't find it, because they didn't go through all the, uh, the tombs. And that's fine. I mean, they don't have to do that, but my feeling is, look, if you don't explore every nook and cranny, you can't complain that there isn't any treasure, right? Um, in fact, somebody made that made a post on um, D and D Beyond. One of the a, a new DM talked about this. He he had his players. Um, <clears throat> they were hired to steal something from a noble, and they went into his house. and And what they did was they sort of focused. Now, this is a tough room. We should have multiple enemies. But these are all yellow, so we're just going to attack. They don't have a lot of special abilities. Um, they focused on the thing they were trying to steal. They did a quick smash and grab. They got the item, and they got out. And they didn't, like, explore the rest of the mansion. They didn't find all the cool magic items that the um, that the noble had in his house that the uh, DM had put in there for them to find. So they didn't get any treasure. They just got the reward for stealing whatever it is they stole, but they didn't get the actual treasure from the noble's house that would have been a lot better than the reward, right? And and then they went, they did a second mission, they were working for a thieves' guild or something, and they did the same thing, like, go, go, like, kidnap this person and bring him in, and they did it, like, off the street very quickly, and they didn't go into his house, and they didn't explore his house, and they didn't get any treasure there. And so he actually made a post and said, what do I do when my players are not getting treasure and uh, my response was, they don't get it. Right? If they if they want treasure, they've got to look for it. And if they say, look, it's not our mission to look for treasure, and so we're not going to look for it, then that's their choice. They don't get treasure. Right? To me, um, you know what? It, kind of what what you do in the mission in the adventure has consequences. And if you choose not to explore, then there's a consequence to that, which is you're not going to find the stuff that you would have found if you had explored. Uh, just like here, if so that, that middle floor didn't have anything on it. If we had come up this elevator first and found both um, items, and I had said, I'm not going to go into that other floor, mission's complete, we're done, I'm not going to bother, there's a consequence to that. And that consequence is that we don't get as much experience, we don't get as many experience points for doing the mission which means we're going to have to do more missions to gain a level, which means we might out-level, we might um, run out of story arc and mission content before we hit level 45. Um, I can't get mad that the story arc content ended if I've been whipping through missions and not getting most or all of the experience for those missions. Right? So I think by the same token if a bunch of players in D&D are not exploring, because that's what their characters would do, they wouldn't explore, that's fine, but then don't complain you don't have any magic items. Now I'm not talking about my cleric, you know, he, he his point wasn't, we haven't found any magic items, his point was, we found magic items and I've given them all to you guys, and we are lucky we did not aggro both of these bosses. His point was, I've been giving all the magic items to you guys. It's my turn to get one. Which, you know, I agree with. It is his turn. All 
Alright, so now we have two bosses. One of them is Malta. I think we're going to go after the Malta first. And I've got to go in here and debuff both of these guys. There we go. Oh, Mo needs help, and Larry needs help. There we go. Yeah, let's kill this Malta. Hurry up. There we go. He's done, and now we can go after the security chief. Larry's taking a beating for some reason in this particular battle, but we've got these guys. And Curly's put the hold on him, so that's good. And I'm going to tell you guys to stay here for the moment, and we're going to go look for the glowy. There it is. Is there anybody down here? There is not. So we can grab it. And mission complete. There we go. And those little flame guys are Curly's minions, the minions of my minion. So, Mystic Research. Files on a minute. Here we go. These Cray files indicate that Nimin is greatly sensitive to psychic emanations. This allows her to locate many supernatural and paranormal dangers before they are a threat. So we contact Ghost Widow, who says, So Nimin is sensitive to psychic emanations. I see. I will need to find a way to take advantage of that. I think I'll also report to Lord Recluse about Cray's study of me. I doubt he'll be pleased, and that will bring bad business to the Cray. That does leave the matter of those Malta group people. But I don't think that's going to concern us for a while. Yeah, Malta's going to be very tough to fight with these minions, I think. We're going to have to really watch out for the sappers. Numina is drawn to psychic emanations, but even once she's been drawn in, she'll need to be kept in place to keep her from escaping. I've spoken with Soroko, and he's been very willing to help me. He's almost nice to me, actually. It's strange. Don't trust him. But then, neither of us wants Numina poking her astral nose into our affairs. Soroko thinks he may have a way to draw her in. I want you to speak with him about it. At the same time, ask him if he's found a suitable group of carnival folk. I have a plan to hold her in place, but I need some of the carnival's face masks to do it. I asked him for help finding a carnival group. So we're going to go speak to Soroko. Where is the arrow? There it is. I was having trouble locating the little waypoint, but this must be the way in. Yeah, it's always sort of interesting to me. The waypoint was on this door, but all three of these doors lead in here. And I wonder what determines which door it puts the waypoint in. Just out of curiosity, you know. Like, I would have put it on the center one. Same thing here, right? Any of these, either of these elevators will lead us up, but this is the one that's got the waypoint on it. Why? I mean, there must be some sort of algorithmic, you know, reason, but I don't know. Anyway, ah, oh yes, Nightmare Last. The rising star among our legions of darkness. I have heard that Ghost Widow has come to depend on you, and I see evidence of this in your presence. As she prepares her trap for Numina, she sends you to speak with me. Yes, I can create a spell that will act as a beacon for Numina's psychic sight. And while I am preparing it, no doubt, the Widow seeks a group of carnival revelers for their masks. I know just a place out in St. Marshall. You'll need to gather about six of the lesser masks. So this is going to be a... Oh, maybe it's not. I, I thought this was going to be a... Um... Um, street hunt, but I guess not. We'll see when we get to St. Marshall.
Music's pretty cool in here, I have to say. I am tired of the constant evil gloominess, but the music is pretty cool. I mean, I can't argue with the quality of the design. It's just the uninterrupted misery and gloom of the place for 50 straight levels. And you just never even get a nice bright sunny day throughout the Rogue Isles. Uh, I feel like that was pretty bad design. All right, let's uh, select this task. Can we TP to it? Looks like we can. That's the quickest and easiest way to do it. Okay, one thing I want to check, do we have, we don't have recharge reduction yet. We definitely need that. At some point, we need to get it. I mean, I can just buy it as well. I think last time I checked, we didn't have the ingredients for it. I'll have to do that back at the base after this episode. We're going to do this mission and then I'm going to stop because it's time for lunch. So this is just Garnies? Alright, well, they're no problem. I fought, I fought them like eight times on the newspaper missions, because it just kept offering me Carney mission after Carney mission. Oh, and one of the reasons was the Carney missions of the ones offered were the ones that didn't require uh, recovering a victim, like, which would be a lead out, you know, for or kidnapping somebody. They were mostly go get this item. And, or go defeat this boss. And so I was like, okay, good. If I don't have to lead people out, so much the better. I, I can't stand the lead outs. So we need to find six masks and then get Riala's mask. So the masks are probably just going to come in, I would guess, as the kills happen. But maybe not. Maybe there are glowies. Hard to tell. We won't know until we find the first one. Oh, there's a glowy, so I guess it's glowies. Ah, okay. So six glowies to find. No problem. It's sort of a medium to large size um, map. It's not super huge, but it's not small either. These illusionists are so horrible. They cheat. So now this one is held. And yet she's still going to be able to go intangible even though she's held. Right there. You see that? Now, as a player, I can't do that. When I'm held, I can't do anything. I really don't like it when the NPCs cheat. That, that's just annoying. I mean, yes, you know, like as a DM, sometimes they make villains that can do things players can't do, but the villains do not, the bad guys do not have their own rules. Like if I, like let's say the invisibility spell, right? The invisibility spell in D&D, &D, when you attack, it makes you turn visible. I'm not going to give a villain invisibility and say, oh, but when, the vil when this villain attacks, he doesn't turn visible so he can attack you and stay invisible. No, the rules for invisibility are very clear. If the villain has an invisibility spell, he should have to follow those rules. And I think the same thing works here. The rules for holds are very clear. When you're held like this, you can't turn on any of your powers. And yet, somehow, no other villains can do it. None. But the carnival um, lieutenants can go D-solid while held. Now, if they went D-solid before he held them, then he shouldn't be able to hold them, right? But once held, right, they're locked. They shouldn't be able to do anything. 
Just like when I'm held, I can't do anything. So I think this is going to be our kit, guys. I will take both purples and oranges. And maybe the occasional break free for an emergency. But I think our kit is not going to include heals because I never use them. And our accuracies are going to be for when we fight somebody that our minions can't hit. Curly is running out of endurance. So there are four glowies to find plus the boss. Go kill. Oh, Redcon. Plus two. We are very, very close to hitting level 41. So I thought that I was going to be um, playing a lot by myself before bringing you guys back. But we've got a big chunk of the way through this level. I mean, we were already three or four beats into it when we started. But, um, but this story arc's given us an awful lot of experience. And when we get the story arc XP, that's going to get us a big chunk too. We're only two beats away, so I don't think you're going to miss much before I bring you back for the level 41 story arc. And I think what I'm going to do is, once we're done with this arc, if I have to go through a beat or so, um, I'm going to do newspaper missions, much as I don't like churning through them. To get myself to level 41, I do have two other contacts, but I figure let's start getting to the broker so that after I do the next story arc with you guys at level 41, I don't have that many newspaper missions to do before I get another story arc. And I hear another glowy and there's a strong man. Go get him. Oh, we missed the Seneschal over there. Gotta go get her. And these guys make such short work of the carnies. Let's go kill her because she could bother me on the way back. Don't know if we're going to get ambushed. I love when people try to use, when when the villains try to use fire on my demons. Yeah, that doesn't work on me. These are fire demons, or some of them, or ice demons. Fire doesn't really work on them. And there is another glowy. So I am going to orchestrate this a little bit so they don't fall down. Now attack. Curly's getting his endurance housed because um, he uh, he's standing right there, right? And the carny death screams drain your endurance. There's pretty much no way around that, especially for these minions. I mean, I could I could throw luck on him, but it's not worth it. So we're down to two masks as soon as I finish this. There we go. I, 
guess for this I should really be carrying an endurance. Um, or two. But we can wait a sec for Curly's endurance to come back as we approach the boss. This guy we can TP. Now we shouldn't miss with this thing. I have triple accuracy on it. It's just hard to believe with this power that I thought was a mistake. It's now four slotted. And I'm considering five slotting it and putting a recharge on it. Alright, curls. You're getting hell on earth. You're getting pain bringer. The group gets world of pain. I get rune of protection. Curly gets mez defense. And then come with me. attack and these guys are also going to need two hit buffs and I can't hit the debuff until they're affecting her there we go nope I did it at the wrong time we need to focus on her not on the illusions Let's give some resistance to my guys. Focus on her. Do not fight the illusions. Let's give some mes defense to my guys. Got her. Alright guys, now come with me. Get away from the illusions. No, get away from them. Can't do anything to it. Stay away from it. It takes like for freaking ever. Let's just desummon them. Um, and I'll resummon them when we get to the next set of masks. Those phantasms can't do anything to me. They're not part of the mission and they stay up for like 10 actual minutes, like of real time. It's insane how long they stay up. And again, and I've talked about this before, like with my Scrapper and Stalker. They shouldn't, they shouldn't, st once she's dead, they should not stay up. But, because, like, my guys don't stay alive. My guys aren't illusions generated by me. They're actual creatures, physical creatures, that are brought in from another dimension. And yet when I die, they all die too, right? And if they were robots... They're certainly not illusions. I go unconscious and somehow the AI of the robots is completely incapable of continuing without me if I'm a robot mastermind. Thugs. My thugs disappear if I'm a thug mastermind. But an illusion summoned by an illusionist stays around for 10 minutes after she's dead. It just so completely counterintuitive in terms of just like in-game logic, right? World logic. I, I just don't like stuff like that. And I just took those because we don't need them. I guess I should have given them to Curly, but it doesn't really matter. I'm a fan of the break freeze, I'll say that. And there are the last two glowies. Go get them, guys.
I love that I can like collect this stuff while my minions are pounding on somebody. Not something you can do if you're like a scrapper or a stalker or almost anybody else. And this should be the end of the mission. We are done. Oh, there's a lieutenant. Didn't realize that. Go get him, guys. And once Carly has him locked down, we're good to go. So that's two examples of the illusionists and master illusionists violating the rules. The regular illusionists violate the rules on hold, and they can go desolid even while they're held, which they shouldn't be able to do. And the master illusionists violate the rules on summoning, where everything else that gets summoned, everything else, when the summoner is dispatched, goes unconscious or dies, the summon thing immediately disappears. But for the master illusionists, nope, they stay around. And I just don't like that because it breaks the rules of the world. I like consistency of the rules. I think it hurts verisimilitude when the rules are inconsistently applied. There are other summoned creatures that stick around afterwards that at least, although they break the rules of the world, of the, of the game, they don't necessarily break the logic of the world. So like the automated auto turrets, I can see them staying around after their summoner dies because they're AI, right? They're auto turrets. But a, an illusion was summoned magically. When the caster dies, the ritual ends. And especially since that's how we have to uh, behave as well. So, okay, we got to go back to Scirocco. Sirocco, sorry. Um, I think we'll end here. We'll talk to Sirocco, and then we will stop for this episode. We're probably getting pretty close to the end of the story arc, and we're also getting pretty close to level 41. We're only about a bead and a quarter away from it. And then we have to figure out what we're going to do for our level 41 power. And I have to see what they're going to offer us, of course, too. Back to Granville. And I guess we should turn invisible here just to make sure that we don't get shot at. All right, guys, I'm going to pause it here, and I'll bring you back when we are at Sirocco. And here we are. He says, you arrive at just the proper moment. We have created the self-sustaining beacon. I call it the sand riddle once set in motion it will produce a great deal of psychic noise all of which will look very ominous indeed to Numina take it to Ghost Widow as a token of my goodwill to her but I should warn you drawing Numina in even holding her in place are but a start those actions will not guarantee you victory I seem to recall a story about bells and cats that might be appropriate but I'll leave it to you to handle not sure what story he's talking about. Ghost Widow over here says... Excellent. My trust in you has been rewarded. I will take these masks at the spell. Soon, Numina's interference will be at an end. So my guess is this next mission or two will be the end of the story arc. But we will stop for now, and we will continue in the next episode. Until then, I am Scrabberlock, and this has been City of Villains on the Rebirth server.